Namaste and good morning. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Nisandhan Sanstan, Nai Dili, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag by policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special lecture on the impact of COVID-19 on India's non-profit sector by Ms. Ingrid Srinath. This discussion is being organized by the Center for Human Dignity and Development at IMPRI. I feel privileged to introduce the chair for the session, Mr. Amita Behar. Sir is the Chief Executive Officer at Oxfam India, a global civil society leader, and an authority on tackling economic and gender inequality and building citizen participation. Mr. Behar currently serves as the Vice Chair of the Board of Civicus, a global alliance of civil society organizations and activists dedicated to strengthening citizen action and civil society across the globe. He also serves on the boards of several other organizations, including the Center for Budget and Governance Accountability and Indian Public Policy Think Tank. Prior to Oxfam, Mr. Vihar was the Chief Executive Director of National Foundation for India and served as the convener for National Social Watch Coalition and the co-chair of Global Call to Action Against Poverty, a network of over 11,000 civil society organizations. Welcome, sir. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the speaker for this session. Sir. Please go ahead and introduce all the panelists as well. My yes. thank you. Thank you, thank you. I am honored to introduce our eminent speaker for today, Ms. Ingrid Sheena. Ma'am is presently the founder director of the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy at Ashoka University, the first academic center in South Asia to focus on these themes. CSIP has produced path-breaking research on philanthropic flows, the impact of changes in foreign funding, the nonprofit ecosystem and regulatory reform, Besides providing world-class capacity building programs for nonprofit leaders and young people starting their careers in the sector. A graduate of the Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata, Ma'am transitioned from her 12 year career in advertising to the nonprofit sector in 1998 with Child Rights in You, where she was the CEO. Spearheading the movement to amend India's constitution to make education a fundamental right was a key achievement of her tenure as CEO. Following that, she served as Secretary General at Civicus, World Alliance for Citizen Participation. She was Executive Director of Child Aid India Foundation, India's Emergency Helpline for Children in Distress, and subsequently CEO of Hivis India, the Indian arm of the Dutch Global NGO. She is a member of Niti Aayog's Voluntary Sector Committee, and served on SEBI's technical committee for the Social Stock Exchange. In 2020, she received the Distinguished Alumina Award from her alma mater, the Indian Institute of Calcutta. She has also served on the advisory boards of the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Development Cooperation Forum, the World Economic Forum, the Young Lives Project at Oxford University, Alliance Magazine, Hasiru Dala, Dana Mojo, the Prajanya Trust, India Development Review, the Center for African Philanthropy and Social Investment, Give India COVID Relief Fund and Fair Share of Women Leaders, and on boards of the Worldwide Initiative for Grant Maker Support, the Resource Alliance, the INGO Accountability Charter, the Rules, Public Interest Registry, and Mount Risker. Ma'am has been a passionate advocate for human rights, social justice, and civil society for over two decades. We welcome you, ma'am. We are, fortunate, you, we are fortunate to have with us Ms. Medha Onyal, Mr. Binoy Acharya, and Mr. Jagannanda Jay as the discussions for the session. Ms. Medha Onyal is the Program Director, Livelihoods at Pratham Education Foundation, Mumbai, Maharashtra. Welcome, ma'am. Mr. Binoy Acharya is the Founder Director at Unnati, Organization for Development Education, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Jagannanda J is the mentor and co-founder at the Center for Youth and Social Development, Orissa. 
Welcome, sir. Now, I invite our chair for his opening remarks and further invite our speaker for her lecture. We look forward to an enriching discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima. And thank you, uh, Center for Human Dignity and Development at IMPRI. Uh, delighted to be here. And I must say that the topic that you've picked is uh, extremely important for all of us. And the panel members here and our uh, key speaker, we've been discussing this question pretty much on a 24 seven basis. So thank you for organizing this. And I must say that you could not have found a better speaker and better respondents uh, on this issue. So I'm really looking forward to this, this conversation. Uh, let, let me just start by kind of framing the conversation. And uh, this, these are some of my questions. I'm sure in grid you'll help us tease some of these questions, but uh, take it further. This obviously was an absolutely unprecedented year. We've, we've not witnessed uh, what we saw uh, in the last year. It, probably in the last century, we've not seen it. It's, it's, it's been disruptive in so many ways, but I must also put a spotlight on at least two specific stories which are heart-wrenching, uh, but, but kind of also symbolic of what we went through. The first was last year's migrant crisis. We saw uh, the agony of uh, lakhs of people actually walking back on foot from the metro towns, from the big cities to their source villages. When the temperature was 41, 42 degrees and they were going back with no food, uh, no water at times, heartbreaking uh, what, what we saw. And the second is, I would say this April, May, when the country was literally gasping for oxygen. What we might hear on the floor of the parliament uh, is what the government says, but we certainly from our own experiences know that the country was literally gasping for oxygen. We have seen our own near and dear ones actually die, not because of the virus sadly, but because of lack of oxygen. So just wanted to put that frame that it, it is such an unprecedented time. Uh, how has the not-for-profit sector responded to it is, is the big question that we need to try and understand. But more importantly, I would look at how does this pandemic, this disruption reconfigure the not-for-profit sector? How does it change it? Uh, what are going to be the implications on the not-for-profit uh, uh, sector for us? So again, just, just as part of the context, let me say the second big context, that it was a really a odd contradictory times for the not-for-profit sector. The last year's budget actually told us, the union budget told us that the not-for-profit sector needs to go every five years to even get their income tax registration renewed. So the regulatory frame was actually squeezing the, the not-for-profit sector. And this was followed by six months later with the FCRA amendments, which have made an already draconian law more draconian. So that's that's one part of the context. And then we got extremely confusing signals from the Niti Ayo and from the prime minister saying that civil society is uh, a, a very, very important partner for us. They are the ones who are at the forefront. Seemed like very sincere, genuine appreciation of the work the civil society was doing. So that's that's also the contradictory context that I want to set in because if you're looking at long-term trends, we will need to understand what's happening. Why is the space getting squeezed? On the other hand, why are we getting this, this uh, appreciation? So in this context, I just wanted to now uh, end uh, Ingrid with three questions uh, and for, for everyone, three or four questions. But let me, before I go there, let me just say that from my personal experience, I can say that the not-for-profits sector has done an absolutely amazing job. It's done a stellar job of really reaching the most marginalized, the most excluded, 
the people in the greatest uh, misery. And, and we have done way beyond the capacity or organizational muscle that the sector has. So, you know, I, I'm sure when history is written, the role of civil society would be written in golden words about what and how we responded to the uh, COVID crisis. But, but looking at the questions, you know, one, I'm very keen that we, this has helped us put the spotlight in words. And, and many of us here, as in certainly Jagdaji, uh, Binoy, uh, Ingrid, I, we've certainly been involved in looking at how it affected the sector personnel itself. There are more than hundreds of civil society actors, activists who have passed away because of COVID. And you know the, the big question of our own internal mechanisms, how do we cope with these tragedies? What are the social security benefits within the sector? How's our sector organized is, is one set of questions I think we must really look at. I think it's, it's critical moving ahead uh, uh, that, that we start strategically and structurally uh, addressing these, these questions. The second big one uh, for me is the, what does this do to the funding? Anyways, the funding landscape was changing dramatically uh, with FCRA kind of withdrawing, with CSR not being able to come in, with Indian philanthropy, both uh, in spurts growing with few big ones coming in and the projections that uh, individual philanthropy was going to uh, explode in India. So, so you know, the landscape was changing dramatically. But what we saw last year, that pretty much funding was taken away from development, regular developmental work of work on, say, gender justice, Dalit empowerment to work around COVID relief. Is it a temporary phenomena? How will it reorganize the entire funding landscape is a big question because it would have serious implications uh, uh, on us. The third and big one for me is that if I take you back to the contradiction in terms of the government, uh, was the government telling us, was it giving us a strong message that do the service delivery role, you're welcome in this country. Uh, and that's what in a way the FCRA amendment was also telling us. If you do service delivery, you're welcome. You are a valued partner. But if you get into your second role, which many civil society actors believe is their fundamental role of seeking accountability from power, holding power to account, then you're not there. So what does this pandemic do to us? Will we be able to do both the roles? In, in my lifetime now I've learned, I started with, I'll be honest and candid, saying, okay, charity is important, but our job is to hold the governments accountable. But I, I would at this juncture not privilege one over another, but I certainly believe that both are very, very critical. And how do we now arrange ourselves uh, around this role? Because it is, it is pretty much a, such a disruption that will change how the civil society is, is uh, shaped and how it uh, moves ahead. So those are two, three questions, not to set obviously any boundaries for you, Ingrid. Anyways, we cannot set boundaries for you. Uh, you'll say what you want to say. So over to you, Ingrid. Let me just also share the structure, what we are hoping, if it's all right with everyone, that we request Ingrid to speak for uh, 20 minutes. And then we come back to Medha, Jagdaji, and Binoy for responses, five to seven minutes each. Uh, then we move to the participants, uh, take questions from them, uh, and come back for a final round of two, three minutes each with maybe four or five minutes for Ingrid uh, to both respond to the questions that we might have, respond to each other, and also then kind of give us some concrete ideas for moving ahead. So if that's all right with everyone, uh, I'll request Ingrid to start. Over to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Amitabh, and thank you, IMPRI, for this invitation and this platform. Thank you to all of you for uh, being here today. So let me start um, with the, the scenes that Amitabh uh, mentioned. We, in our sector, I think, remember those scenes quite vividly. 
though I feel that in the public out there, those scenes are fading quite rapidly from memory. Uh, we remember the migrant workers that Amitabh spoke of desperately trying to reach their homes as they were reduced to penury literally overnight by this draconian lockdown that uh, was announced with four hours notice. And then more recently, the we saw how our public health systems that we know are chronically under-resourced, um, buckled under the strain and everything from oxygen to ICU beds to healthcare staff to medication to even cemeteries and, and crematoria uh, became uh, something that the average Indian citizen had to scramble for. Um, and through this, the one set of people in a sense that came through for India's citizens were each other and the nonprofit sector. And whether it was alleviating distress or providing critical healthcare and livelihood support, or as significantly shining a light on the plight of the most marginalized, that role I think has been universally recognized. The question that we set out to answer at CSIP was how are the nonprofits themselves doing? And we've done two studies uh, that have provided a snapshot of the financial, the programmatic, and the organizational impact of the crisis on nonprofits of all types uh, across India. Uh, I'm hoping today to basically take you through the highlights of the second study. Uh, the report of both the reports of both studies are on our website, uh, and I'm hoping that one of my colleagues will post a link uh, in the chat that will allow you uh, to access them. I should clarify that while the the study covered uh, all sizes of nonprofits across all regions, working in diverse thematic areas, funded by a range of uh, funders. Uh, this, the timing of the data collection was, uh, it finished in February 2021. And so it actually captures the state of the sector before the second wave hit us. As you can imagine, even at that time, I, I, can, I can remember being uh, in one webinar where a, a nonprofit leader said, we were at the stage in February where we thought we could finally see some light at the end of the tunnel. Little did we know that that light was an oncoming train that was going to run us over. Uh, so this is really in some ways as grim as these, this, these data are, uh, they're not the worst case scenario. Um, let me um, share some graphics with you just because that's a whole lot easier to do than talking through them. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, it's on. Man. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, of the 312 nonprofits that responded to our survey, uh, over 70% had been directly engaged in COVID relief work. Uh, we're describing the, 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 the situation nonprofits found themselves in as a triple whammy. The first a hit was, of course, that the communities they work with, there was a surge in the demand for the services that the nonprofits uh, provide. While, and, and as you can see, 63% of the nonprofits said that they saw uh, an increased demand for their services. While they were trying to respond to this increased demand, they found themselves, of course, completely hamstrung by lockdown, by lack of digital uh, technology by uh, the, their inability to keep their own staff safe. And so on their regular operations, 63% of nonprofits said that they were at that point in time um, experiencing a negative impact on their program, on their ability to deliver programs. The three main concerns that they, that, that they faced, the three main challenges that they described were first of all, managing their own staff, managing the safety of their staff and their well-being. The second was how do I execute the programs that my community needs me to execute uh, with, while, uh, while keeping my staff safe. And the third one of course was financial insecurity as donors en masse moved funding from regular programming to COVID relief and or uh, to PM cares and, and other such funds. 60% of the nonprofits said that they had had a negative impact on their funding. 
the vast majority uh, would not have funds to cover their fixed costs beyond 12 months. Only 12% of nonprofits said that they had funding that could cover them beyond 12 months. And of course, this impact, the particular financial impact, is not equally distributed. So while it might be 12% as an average, you would notice that for the very large NGOs, people with budgets over 10 crores, only 1% uh, find themselves in that situation where they will not be able to cover fixed expenses. When you get to the smaller NGOs, budgets under 50 lakhs, uh, what is it? Only 8% will actually be able to cover their, their, uh, their costs for uh, more than 12, 12 months. Um, how are they coping? The, for more than half of them, obviously, the, the instinctive response was to reduce the budget. And this took the form of cutting overheads, cutting, taking voluntary salary cuts, and in the worst cases, downsizing the number of staff uh, that they had uh, on, 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 pay, on their payroll. The third element, of course, of uh, that, 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 that was significant uh, in terms of their ability to respond was how well prepared they were uh, in the digital domain. Uh, in our sample, about a fourth of the respondents said that they felt that they were adequately prepared to deal with the pandemic in terms of their digital preparedness. And another one third said that they had used the first year to really beef up their uh, digital ability. Uh, only 12% felt that they still had, um, were still unable uh, to respond. What they did really was about half of the nonprofits uh, moved at least some of their, uh, their programs uh, to digital while, while maintaining some balance of offline and online, whereas about one fifth uh, moved all their programs online. The last question we asked, uh, because of the timing of the study, we had the opportunity to ask this question is, uh, how do you think that the amendments to the FCRA are going to affect uh, your uh, nonprofit? And it's interesting that the largest number did not respond to this question at all, uh, either because FCRA is not relevant to them or they are fearful of responding or they're not sure. Uh, but of those that responded, so if I if I leave the 38% off, then really it's 60% of the balance felt that they were going to be negatively impacted by uh, the FCRA bill. Subsequent to the actual survey, we had a number of conversations with nonprofit leaders of different kinds across different sectors. And the themes of those conversations were all the words that are listed here in this word cloud. Yes, there was resolve and empathy and compassion, but the predominant feelings were of loss, of burnout, of fatigue, of stress, of grief, of chaos, and most importantly, I think, anger at uh, the entirely preventable crises that they found themselves dealing with. We, the last piece really of uh, the data that I want to present, and I really encourage you to go download the report and because this is only the very top line findings, is clearly the, 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 the pandemic has opened several windows of opportunity. So it's not just public health that we have the opportunity to fundamentally reimagine, but literally every area that we work with, whether it's education or housing or urban development or gender or internet governance or labor rights, even our own nonprofit ecosystem, there's currently a brief window of opportunity to, to make radical change rather than simply tinkering around the edges. Because we have at this point in time, the attention of government donors and the public at large and the media, I should add. So I'll stop sharing here and um, really uh, focus on what I see as the lessons or what the report uh, points out as lessons for uh, nonprofits and funders. I think um, one clear lesson is that there are certain key attributes that make for resilience as an organization. And in our study, we found four. We found 
the flexibility of the funding that you enjoy is a key determinant of your ability to respond. The levels of autonomy in your organization that allow frontline workers to respond and not have to go through 16 layers of decision making before um, they, they have the, 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 the authority to respond. The deepness of the root, the depth of the roots that you have in the community that you serve, and therefore your access to their current needs and how those needs are changing. And finally, of course, the, the technology piece, because that gave a degree of flexibility that, that, that was unavailable to those that did not have it. I think it also therefore makes clear, points to clear direction on how the norms of funding need to change. How do funders need to fund to make that resilience, that agility, that sustainability possible for all of their grantees. It also, I think, as Amitabh alluded to, painted a picture of the price that we are paying as leaders, as staff, for our collective failure to build uh, support systems for the sector, to build the infrastructure of the sector, to build a voice for the sector that would allow us to have greater influence in all of the domains that we work, but also for civil society policy itself. And of course, it paints a picture of what we need to do to completely reinvent social protection in our country. Uh, starting with our own staff, the appalling small number of NGOs that actually provide health insurance to their staff. The fact that the vast majority of NGOs are too small to be able to do group insurance and that we don't have a, a, a sort of sector-wide mechanism uh, to provide this is, um, is, is, I think, another key learning. But more than anything else, I think it also showed us just how strong we are just how adaptive we are, just how empathetic we are, and just how, in some ways, mission-driven we are. So it was regardless of constraints, regardless of policy constraints, regardless of funding constraints, regardless of the physical constraints of being able to, to respond, the sector just said the heck with all that, we're gonna go out and do what we know needs to be done. And I think as a country, uh, we need to be grateful for that. There, um, there are choices that need to be made right now. We don't have this window of opportunity that I'm speaking of is not a, a, a wide one. We need to make some choices right now uh, in terms of whether you're a nonprofit, a funder, a policymaker, to determine are we going to be a more just, a more equal, a more resilient nation at the end of this, or are we going to lurch from one crisis to another with divisions that are increasingly unsustainable, threatening the very fabric of our society? Uh, I think uh, what overall, what the message is of the study is that the pandemic has really revealed what value the nonprofit sector adds to our lives and to our society and why it is necessary to ensure that it can continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ingrid. So thank you for this uh, very you know, powerful uh, presentation with hard data. And, and thank you, as in uh, this is just, just to add my voice to what you have said, to echo, uh, we certainly must celebrate the remarkable work that the civil society has done. So, and you know, you're taking it one step further. And I think it's important that the, the value that we have provided to the nation is also very, very important. I think it's important that people do recognize uh, the value that the civil society has played during this crisis, uh, but even otherwise plays in nation building, in building social cohesion, in building uh, 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 human rights, justice, etc. So thank you. And, and what you're saying, you know, what, what's really important is your challenge in a way, Ingrid, that this is a transformative moment. And this transformative moment is not going to last for long. 
you know, so that's that's very clear. I just wanted to particularly underscore that. And therefore, what is that we need to do? You've talked of it through data and also some very concrete suggestions. So thank you. And we will come back uh, to you. Uh, I'm sure that the study link has been already posted on the chat box because I saw some of the comments asking for the, uh, for the study. So let's now hear three of our uh, friends who work on these issues in terms of responding to what Ingrid is saying. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Medha and then request uh, Binoy and then move to Jagdaji. So five to seven minutes uh, over to you, Medha. Sure. Uh, so generally, as, as echoing what um, Amitabh said, it's a really useful study. I feel like a lot of the conversations that we've been having in our own sort of now Zoom meetings, but otherwise boardrooms and so on, um, were really well articulated by the report. Um, as is opportune right now, uh, everything has been changing around. So I'd just quickly like to share that right now, the role that's been described that I've been doing has also changed. I am, for instance, not even in the house that I'm typically in, I'm stuck in a different location because of a little bit of a health care. So I think the whole world is upside down. So it's befitting for this conversation. Um, just to quickly, I'll, I'll speak to three points that Ingrid spoke um, to, which I thought were really um, spoke to our experience as well. I feel like um, the first point of um, just 12% organizations having a funding um, of over to, of beyond 12 months was really, really surprising. Not surprising, but I think is, is important to um, highlight. I feel like it's a time when we had an increase in priorities that all organizations have, and we've all had a decrease in funding pool that's available for these same activities. Um, as Amitabh said, everybody has stepped up, but we've also been squeezed out a little bit. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, just to go back to an earlier report also, um, I think Brit Span had spoken about specifically what kinds of organizations have lost funds. Um, and organizations uh, run by Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasis, had 70% of them had funds for less than three months ahead. Um, so if we were to think about organizations that work in the most remote parts, in non-metros, uh, serving communities that uh, need most support, they've actually had some of the least amount of funds available. Um, and it's, it's worthwhile consolidation of social and philanthropic capital has been happening over the last couple of years. It's just important to keep in mind um, at what cost that's been happening. Um, so I thought that was a really important point and it's worth thinking about uh, the for the funders to think about that at a time when they've been thinking about how you consolidate to larger nonprofits for longer term impact. How do you also retain organizations that are at the front line of support? Um, to speak to our experience, um, we also had to very quickly pivot during the pandemic at Pratham. Um, and so one of the requests that we had was to work on oxygen concentrator distribution and so on. Um, one of the big learnings also, the second part is about organizational effectiveness, right? And it's about um, how much, how do you navigate that fine line between helping in crisis and just scope creep and just responding to very, very quick needs that um, come up. And so a learning generally was how do you work with organizations, A, that actually work in areas of absolute need. Um, organizations in a remote part of Bihar, organizations in, a, in the border of Jammu and Kashmir, in the Northeast, and so on. Um, and these were the ones that have been most impacted by funding. So it's, it's worth um, calling that out. Um, the other is just uh, the second part about how organizations reconfigure during this time. Um, again, I also understand our experience at Pratham is very different. It's a larger organization with a very large team. Uh, but for us also, it involved basically looking at our existing pieces as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that you had that built a very different picture pre-pandemic. And you had to use those so same pieces to build a very different uh, picture. And so pieces of how you build a muscle to uh, decentralized responsibility and decision making that Ingrid spoke to, I thought, were really important and very hard to continue. Um, but it also, again, to speak to very action specific points, um, the, the, the quick shifts that were required during the pandemic, but remaining anchored to what you know best, 
um, I feel like most organizations in the civil society uh, did really well, um, despite pushes to at some point provide relief, at some point to, again, um, respond to the oxygen crisis in very ad hoc ways. Um, I feel like the ability to know what you do best, areas that you know best, staying anchored to what you know, but drifting a little bit to respond to needs was really crucial and, and needs to be understood by both funders and organizations responding to um, the pandemic um, to not make uh, hasty moves. But I'd just like to spend most of our, like the remainder of the time that I have speaking to the last point that Ingrid said, which is about how do organizations support our own teams? Um, because at a time of an economic crisis, at a time of a health crisis, at a time of all other impacts on education and livelihood in the long term still to be seen, um, safeguarding our own teams is really and crucially important. Um, I think all organizations, even if you're doing anything, you feel like you're not doing enough. Um, and so in our conversations, we also did a brief inward looking study of about 25 organizations to see how they've been supporting their teams. Um, to see whether they've been providing insurance, what's the support that's being provided for vaccination. In case of bereavement, um, how are we supporting our own teams? Um, and it is a conversation that needs to be a lot more structured and a lot more learning needs to happen. As much as you do, it always feels like it's less. Um, and so in our experience, we learned a lot. Um, we saw that every organization responded in the best of their capacity and the need to consolidate this is a lot more, especially by funders. So organizations have gone from trying to do their own campaign fundraising online to create health insurance where possible. But organizations, I think the big highlight is all organizations are trying to do best for their teams. It is about um, funders and people with cap capital and capacity also pushing to enable this a lot more. Um, the same is with vaccination. We saw most organizations uh, trying to help with registrations, trying to help with getting their teams to um, be able to access vaccines, but actually um, being able to support financially where required and so on, we saw were needs. Um, we were also pleasantly surprised to see some organizations attempting to support teams with mental health and seeing really good impact with that. Um, without naming an organization, it's a large organization with about 1,000 employees, and they provided mental health support and coupons to access. Um, and, and while a lot of folks, uh, organizations said we don't want to do this because of stigma attached, um, the organization we spoke to had an experience of what 40% of their employees actually seeking mental health support during the pandemic, um, which just goes to highlight that the more opportunities that you provide to organize it, to your team members and the more support you provide right now, um, it's all very helpful. So I'll pause. Um, I think there's just a lot to be done. Um, to end on a positive note, I feel like even the definition of civil society expanded during the time, as Ingrid said. Um, the nonprofit sector, of course, stepped up, but as did everybody who could. Um, I think in India, everybody has access to poverty a lot more closely than a lot of other countries. And so helping people around your homes was commonly done. Helping in all sides was done quite actively. Um, people on social media are trying to do what they can and so on. But I feel like everybody wanted to step up at least. Um, and it's it's momentum that we should build off on. So um, thanks a lot for the report. This is really, really useful for us. Thank you. Thank you, Medha. And, and uh, thank you for... Uh... Uh, the the comments that you've shared, particularly the last one, I, I think it's very important. It adds richness to this conversation about how we have actually, uh, you know, or, or I would say not we, the the civil society in itself has got transformed, and the new actors who've joined in, and, and that's the beauty of civil society. But it's an important point for us to highlight, amplify because there are new actors in the space and how do you work with them in the longer run? That would be a, a very important question for us. And, and uh, I, I think, you know, the question that you're asking, what Ingrid said is one of our central questions that uh, uh, how do we not only as individual large organizations or individual sensitive organizations take care of our colleagues, our, our comrades, but how is it a systemic response? I think that's, that's a big one for, for all of us. And uh, I just wanted to kind of, uh, I, I'm sure uh, 
uh, Binoy or Jagdaji will speak about it, but uh, uh, Biraj Patnayak uh, at NFI and many of other colleagues are also looking at a civil society resilience fund, which is essentially addressing this, this question. Um, so, so thank you, Medha. Over to you, uh, Binoy. Yeah, thanks, Samita. Uh, <clears throat> nice uh, listening to Ingrid. And the points mentioned by Ingrid, I fully agree with them. You have done the study in February, but we did another study in June, early part of June. So that also covered the second uh, phase of the pandemic. But before I get into that, I must say that what Medha and Amika have been saying, and then it was mentioned, creating social security for NGO sector. In fact, Amitabh's predecessor, Mr. Ghosh, in his time in NFI, talked about creating such a fund. We haven't talked about it, but never we have acted on it. Perhaps this is the time. In fact, caring the carer is very important. In NGO sector, we as carer have never looked into our own interest. So that's one point we need to be careful about. And uh, <clears throat> then perhaps move ahead. Let me go back to, because <clears throat> basically I'm supplementing what Ingrid has mentioned. You know, in May uh, <clears throat> 26, a uh, few of us like uh, CYSD, Priya, uh, Samarthan, SSK and Unnati, we did a small kind of a consultation with CSOs. Basically, to, on this topic exactly, that what has happened to the NGO, CSO, CSOs. And uh, naturally, what Ingrid mentioned, we talked about that. Uh, uh, subsequent to that, we did a study. And in that study, 577 CSOs. It's a big sample. 577 NGOs participate, big, small, all kinds. And uh, 28 out of 29 states, 28 states covered in this. Of course, some states, there is less number of CSOs. What, in fact, came out from the study is in one word that uh, 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 CSOs are under, in this period, CSOs are understaffed, what Medha was mentioning. They were under-resourced. They were under-recognized, under-protected, but yet, immersed in the community service to prove to their swadharm of serving the people. In fact, they have all negative sides to, to their side, but still then they continue to serve. And uh, <clears throat> I'm a, uh, Mamita has already mentioned that the COVID is not a, just a <clears throat> public health emergency, global public health emergency. It has actually India opened many fault lines and migrant workers is one big fault line. We never understood that such a big migrant workers are there. And now a lot of work needs to be done. We also realize that how fragile is our economy. In fact, everybody has lost jobs, economy has gone to crisis, people don't have money to buy things. In fact, even at the uh, <clears throat> June, July, when the Kharif crop used to be um, cultivated, people didn't have money to even buy seeds. So that was a level of liquidity people had. But <clears throat> NGOs, the 577 NGOs, in fact, I today I was looking into one message kind of information can the World Economic Forum has identified 50 CSOs who have done excellent work reaching the last mile. But in India, 50 is not enough. Such a large country, what Amita was mentioning, we need thousands and thousands. In fact, we need <clears throat> lacks of uh, uh, CSOs to reach. And uh, <clears throat> we found out that, let me just, I have not really made a presentation because five minutes very difficult to make a presentation. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we have found out that um, uh, more than two third of CSOs work in one to five districts and the ingredient with a budget of less than one crore, that budget sometimes goes to even 20 lakhs. So two third of NGOs, and these are young institutions, 16 to 20 year old. 90% of them have direct grassroots experience with a mix of activities like campaign, research, training, networking, all that. And one fifth uh, budget is one to five crore, and only 18% have more than five crore. So 
point is <clears throat> two third means <clears throat> 60 66 67% ngos are basically smaller ngos with minimum number of staff with small funding and they in fact <coughs> reach to the <coughs> maximum number of people and we found out that in an average they have reached 12500 families per ngo in an average but the smaller ngo sometimes they reach to only 100 to 1000 families 100 200 500 like that because the resources is so less and with regard to uh, <coughs> Uh, kind of work they have been doing, as you can understand, 78% provide food support, which is basically required because people didn't have money to buy food. Even though prime ministers are uh, free, I should not want to say free, <laughs> free food, uh, uh, people have other requirements. So besides uh, uh, rice and wheat, people have to need, need to eat other things. And 90% provided uh, um, personal hygiene kits. 73% provide medical support. And the medical support includes medicines, support for hospitalization, um, COVID test. In fact, 57% provided people for testing. Because testing is such a, in the second phase, testing was very difficult to be done. And what Medha was mentioning, 20% uh, provided trauma counseling. Because there's so much of anxiety, so 20% provided <clears throat> uh, counseling support. And um, <clears throat> but 70% NGOs in grid provided uh, information support. Because the kind of information we listen from uh, telephone, people are not, not used to understand that. So people reach to the uh, door to door. Uh, uh, very little to social media, but people just don't reach the door. And with, with, with respect, they talk to people so that they, they, they understand what the COVID norms are, what they should be doing. So <clears throat> despite uh, not being um, immunized, vaccinated, they continue to reach home. So 70% reaching home to home is not a small thing. And we, we are never called as COVID, COVID warriors. We are not recognized in the government support, as you rightly said, government support was very minimum to CSOs at the juncture. And uh, with regard to funding, I think that's very, very interesting. 42% use their own resources, whatever little they had savings, they use that to provide relief support. And they have been saying that there are uh, <clears throat> resource agencies, CSRs and other agencies who are providing relief support but not salary and overhead. So as a consequence, people have not been given salary for months together, but people are still working. It's just their, their, their will, their commitment to the sector they have been serving. And 40% could not mobilize any resource. They applied everywhere out of 100%. 40% could not get any resource. Only 7% received CSR support. And 6% they mobilized from community. like traders and lawyers, doctors, uh, volunteers, individual support. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of it, when people are asked, how is your financial situation? 92% said that they lack financial resources. 92%. Samitar, that's a <laughs> kind of warning bell. <clears throat> and these, uh, another 8% who are what Maida talked about is larger institutions. They don't have financial constraint, but bulk of small and medium institutions have financial uh, uh, crisis. 50% lack salary. They are not able to pay. They are paying half salary or quarter salary, not able to pay salary to staff. And 75% uh, <clears throat> during particularly the second, first and second uh, pandemic received uh, intense mobility restrictions. In fact, government has not mobilized. In fact, local a doctor has been asking the PhD doctor is asking the CSO to come and do social distancing, but the district authority is not providing a pass. So this is again contradiction within the government. The lower level someone is asking support, but higher level you don't get a pass. <clears throat> so overall, what Ingrid is saying, I fully agree because currently our operating environment is very. Narrow. 
in fact we are completely isolated and uh, the resource base is completely changed <coughs> so this is the time we need to critically look into our own functions because india as the csos can only function with small and medium agencies large institutions can reach to some places but i have seen myself the best work is always done for by sub granting what amitabh and other institutions have been doing because they provide good quality services at lower cost <coughs> and that with the fcra change is not possible in fact amitabh my loss is minus because this came in september our new grant supposed to come in june so june to september whatever we spent that is also gone <laughs> so it is a minus <laughs> so <laughs> in green what we are talking about they don't have money for one month two months i don't have money for minus three months <laughs> so that that the situation but i want to tell you one thing <clears throat> amitabh we need to actually work on the area of uh, uh, um, holding power account because we are fearless we cannot continue we'll do uh, service delivery wherever required because ngos have done incredible work in the disaster situations we will do that but take for example if the government is not going to improve our healthcare services are you going to sit idle not say anything and i don't want to get into party politics but my colleagues have informed me that <clears throat> all our front line workers and even community volunteers they are now covered by insurance by uh, rajasthan government chiranjeevi yojana it provides 5 lakh insurance to families and all our people are covered under this because anybody who is not providing income tax are covered under this scheme so most of our front line workers and volunteers community workers are covered under it and we did that systematically in last 3 months we are campaigning for that so what my point is we need to use our government resources to protect bulk of our staff then find out other resources to cover thank you great thank you thank you binoy uh, and uh, you know let let me just again underscore a grim reality and i've just written your words you said we have a narrow operating space and shrinking financial base uh, you know and if you just uh, put this that along with what meenha was saying uh, that the the resource um, scarcity is felt much more by groups which work on on issues of adivasis dalits bahujans uh, then i think the story is grimmer and then you further add the the layer from your study that two third of the not for profits are working with less than a crore so it is a grim grim picture uh, and and i would actually request uh, uh, ingrid that we must get into a study where we actually take away the top 500 uh because they skew the conversation and then look at uh, uh, the civil society and how it's 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 performing and the second point i think binoy i really like uh, your your idea that uh, we need to continue holding the government accountable and also even for our own uh, colleagues and and peers because there are uh, this social security inbuilt in the welfare architecture of of india and that's something we must certainly try and channelize to our own colleagues and also for the larger community great thank you binoy and there's some requests for your study but i see that uh, anshuman and then i think ingrid has also shared the link to uh, your study also yeah anshuman can share that yeah it's been there so over to you jagda ji you also play a very important role in terms of bridging uh our voice with the niti ayog uh so you know it would be also good to hear what's the government thinking around some of these questions jagda ji jagda ji you're muted please unmute yourself yeah yeah thank you thank you amitabh and uh, ingrid uh, binoy and uh, you know all the panelists including uh, meda i am so delighted that you know the, the the issue has been brought on the table and uh, 
but you know let let you know the way i looked at the whole study both the studies i was part of the second study also with along with binay along with priya and along with other uh, frontline uh, our biradri but uh, this this particular time when we are talking about the civil society role its contribution the challenges it it has faced the problems it has encountered the innovative niche in which it has operated i think this is a very hard time actually very hard time i i have no words to share that you know the pandemic is not over we are in the midst of the pandemic the third phase is likely to come and if third phase is likely to come you know we have to really fine tune some of our strategies how to deal with that the second the background of this entire process which has been uh, put together by impri is you know in a situation like this this is a biological disaster basically and in a disaster situation you need many hands approach government and civil society both are very very important government has a primary role but civil society also has a very critical role so we we have to recognize that and then you know with this backdrop if i look at the reports both the reports of you know one shared by ingrid the other by bina i see you know four things actually the first thing is the innovations the civil society brought this time actually first page we were scared by the returnee migrants with amitabh highlighted so well articulated so powerfully actually we have seen that drama happening on the roads happening on the lorries happening everywhere on bicycles on rail tracks everything but you know and then some civil society gave some food some water some biscuits and all that some lorry facilitation all that but when they come back to their source station to the back to their villages you know what happened after then after you know afterwards i see that really provided a great opportunity for thinking of a rural renasa i would say you know working on the revival of the rural economy and there were many things which happened actually and so i think you know in the second phase of the study i'm sure in greed and uh, binay and all of us we should really identify what were the innovations on which civil society put its energy and limited resources at actually i remember in odisha when we started working with the returning migrants in their back home the skill sets which they needed actually to remain in their villages yet get sufficient resources or if resources at par with the with the uh, with the salary or wages they were getting at the destination point as a migrant worker you know was phenomenal actually and with little bit training with little bit effort that changed the whole you know what you call chemistry actually and many of them when you talk to them they said we would not like to go back actually we would not like to go back it's it's better we work here so that that is the kind of innovation i would like to see on the gender based violence actually the national crime controls record bureau identified several sensitive districts across the country where sexually gender based violence has really gone up right and then we picked up two such districts did some work during the second phase and the result is phenomenal actually so the point i wanted to drive is you know civil society has really worked very innovatively besides providing food shelter water uh, and vaccination what you call support and uh, you know and helping with a range of ic what you call uh, work through a very powerful public education public awareness drive that is something i think we need to really capture how great civil society has done because at this point of time with uh, you know it's 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 a opportune moment actually to capture all that number one number two amitabh said about what was happening in the government you know how we were relating right although i am a member of the civil society standing committee 
But let me tell you, the coordination mechanism, which was supposed to be put in place between the government and the civil society at various layers of the government, from the national level to the state level, to the district level, and even at the panchayat level, I think that framework was not there actually. You know, it's it's a it's a very you know we need a very powerful framework at this point of time. At the national level, through Niti, we had few meetings actually, and in those meetings there were one-sided meetings. You know, meetings in which government wanted to tell what they are doing, how they are tackling the situation. They had very little time to listen to the pains and agonies of the you know civil society actually. And this was a very good moment and government lost that opportunity. You know, so therefore they could never capture the pains, agonies and frustration of the civil society and the grassroots realities on the ground actually. So, so you know, the third range of activities I would very strongly suggest besides uh, de demanding seeking accountability, besides demanding uh, seeking, uh, you know, besides reaching the unreached areas through services. The third one could be, you know, also providing feedback to the government, grassroots feedback to the government, evidence-based feedback to the government so that policies can change actually, activities can be fine-tuned. And, you know, we provide a very good platform and space to provide that kind of feedback. So I think uh, at the national level, that was a little bit one-sided. And uh, although we, you know, we got some opportunity to say what is happening, but they were not acted upon actually. That is my point I wanted to say. The second part of the you know, framework was uh, of, you know, in interaction with the National Disaster Management Authority, through which Home Ministry was issuing advisories, guidelines, et cetera. You know, I was invited, I was part of that. Every week we were meeting and we were talking and at least NDMA was following it up, following it up, up to the district level, up to the state level, but the, the buck stopped at the state capitals. It never moved from the state capital onwards. So that was the biggest problem we faced because the real action happens at the district and at the sub-district level. So there was, you know, so this coordinating mechanism, I think researchers need to really look at this and really come out with a very powerful framework so that even during the third phase of this pandemic, even during subsequent pandemics or of this kind type, even less of lesser magnitude, I think we are better prepared as partners between the government and civil society. The second one. The third one is from in this pandemic, in the second phase, we lost, you know, even if we are understaffed, even if we are under resourced, even if we are underprotected, yet we responded to the challenge from small to big, everyone has responded to the challenge. And, and they were all being part of the initiative. They never sat, you know, sat silently actually as observers. They were change makers, change makers always do something. So therefore, I think complementing the work of the civil society, recognizing the work of the civil society and really identifying the kind of outreach which civil society uh, provided in reaching the last mile, in identifying the most vulnerable and needy communities and reaching them, I think it was phenomenal actually. So the kind of complement sun which is necessary, the kind of sabasi which is necessary, I think that is something at least if nobody pats us, we should pat at, at our back and say that sabas beta, you have done, have done your job. You know, thank you. The, Fourth element is, you see, the warriors who lost their lives. Well, NFI as an entity has done something, doing something. We are doing something in Odisha. There are others who are doing, but that is not enough, actually. The people who, who the, the warriors, I would say, the frontline warriors of civil society who lost their life, I think we need a confidence building measure right now. So that the new generation, the young generation, when they come, they need to really think that yes, society, you know, do care about frontline civil society activists, even if they are not media men, 
who, who government recognizes, even if they are not health professionals or paramedics, which government recognizes, even if they are not government employees, which government recognizes. But I think the society must recognize them. We must come forward to help them. And because that is the biggest challenge at this point of time. The number is still unknown, but we have lost many warriors. We have lost many warriors and their families who are and single you know, earners of the family. So this family is completely devastated, actually, completely devastated. So how do we really come forward? What are the ways in which we can do? I think that is another area where we need to do some thinking. And my last point is, you see- Jagdaji, can, can you please wind yeah, up here? Yeah, let me wind up. My yeah. last point is, you know, during this silent transition phase from first phase, second phase, and now moving to the third phase, something also interesting has happened. The Indian civil society was heavily dependent through partnership with intermediary organizations, intermediary organizations, who will mediate, who will raise resources and provide that resources to small agencies. And all of you have highlighted that. I think the you know, bearing few like Amitabh and his setup, many intermediary organizations, they have become fatter now during the silent phase. Their staff, they have enhanced their staff capacity. They have created a kind of new architecture of work. And in this new landscape, very silently, a new breed of NGOs who have come actually, and thereby deepening the inequalities between you know, a civil society of international standard and local civil society. I'm sure that they are not sustainable in the long run. You know, if the local action is not sustainable, these you know, these intermediaries are not sustainable. But since it's a silent thing which is going on and nobody is able to map that appropriately, what is happening, how they're burjuing, how, you know, things are happening at that end. I think this is an area of further research, which I didn't find in this study. So I'm sure in greed and others will, will figure out some way to capture this, you know, new development and this new, uh, what you call, uh, uh, you know, this uh, situation of growing inequalities between two types of civil society, which is happening in India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jagdaji. Uh, and thank you, everyone. It's been a stimulating conversation. I'm sure there's several questions. And Jagdaji, let, let me just, you know, uh, say that uh, uh, the last question that you're raising is also very critical. How much of it is because of COVID? Uh, or because of changes in the FCRA. And I, I must say that as Oxfam, we would certainly be very keen uh, to hear and learn from what needs to be done because we are also in a very, very difficult spot. So, so, so you know, the problems that you're highlighting, we are going through those problems. So we need to have a collective solution uh, to this crisis that's been created because of the regulatory regime. Uh, le let me just now uh, go to Arjun. Arjun had anyways been generous with time and he had said we he probably knew that we we're going to overshoot uh, our time so if it's all right if we take another 10 to 15 minutes maximum uh, from everyone and i'll ensure that now we are we stick to that time uh, so let's just first go to arjun because he said he would identify and help us with the questions i would sure. say if you identify three four questions uh, I assume you'll read them out and you're not going to request the... Uh, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. But sir, shall we go to Ingrid, ma'am, first to... I, I, would, I would suggest that let's just also take the questions, questions so that she's able to respond with the questions and, and uh, uh, also the other panelists. Right, I'll be very brief. Shakeb uh, Nabiji is asking, uh, many questions he has asked, but uh, majorly he's also asking that uh, the funding is uh, also going to different areas. Region is is one of his uh, uh, question, and he's saying that I feel that we need to have a general shift in our strategy from global north to global south as a place of the origin of the fund. So some special issues. Uh, another one is saying that I also feel that there is a huge loss in self esteem of NPOs and the team. We do such commendable work, but still we are being squeezed underprotected and under recognized. I see we are the frontline workers in responding to the crisis, but in terms of getting the vaccination, we are not prioritized. Is there something we should be doing collectively? So some protective measures also is being highlighted for not, not, for, not for profit. 
Apurva Gupta ji is saying that how did non-profits prioritize their work of work during the pandemic? Was it based on what the communities urgently required or on the non-profits capacity? How were the two balanced? If panelists could share from their experience, what seemed to be the most pressing form of support required by communities? Did it change over the past year and a half, which has been also covered for the first and second wave by most of the panelists? Again, Shakeb Nabiji is asking, we all agree that foreign funds drastically, as has been elaborated by Ingrid and Binoji, do you think the new normal, the pandemic, has given some insights into non-conventional way of mobilizing resources? or disaster or the emergency needs. There have been also many questions on the chat box. Uh, R. Miraj is asking that government replaces interest its role with elite or technologically driven NGOs to promote their bureaucratic work. So something of you know more uh, moving away from state capital as, as several also highlighting. And then we have uh, many links of all the reports. We will also update all these links to our event page so that everyone can get access later also. Uh, I, I think that's all. So uh, shall we go to Ingrid, ma'am? Ingrid, ma'am, would you like to take any of that? Sure, thanks. Uh, though actually, I think that on in many of these questions, some of my fellow panelists are better placed uh, to respond than I am. Um, I think certainly there's, so I want to, I think that three issues that we really need to look at. One is the issue of, philanthropic norms. Uh, we need concerted advocacy with philanthropists and philanthropic organizations to talk about what works, what is effective in terms of issues to be covered, in terms of geographies to be covered, in terms of types of organizations that are most effective based on evidence, not just based on, I think this is better than that. We need to do, we need to make our case far more cogently and, and, and compellingly. We also need to look at philanthropic norms in terms of how it's giving is happening. So in the, in, in the US, for example, I think 800 or, uh, donor organizations have signed a pledge uh, to make their giving more flexible, to make it more long-term, to make it less onerous in terms of reporting and due diligence requirements. We need to have a similar push here. We're seeing some shifts. I'm looking at the, the Grow Fund, for example, that Adel Give, ATE, and, and some others, BMGF and others are, are, are funding. I'm looking at the Omidyar pledge uh, at the early stages of the, of the, of the pandemic. So there's, there's some what you might call chinks of light uh, in, in the way philanthropy is happening, but we really need a coherent strategy to shift philanthropic norms uh, among domestic philanthropists uh, while we continue to battle on FCRA and other issues. The second one really, the clear out clear finding across all of the questions that you're asking is the need for better sector infrastructure. So whether it is voice in advocacy or whether it is being able to put together uh, an appeal to funders to say 200 NGO workers have died and their families need support or whether it is creating our own group insurance scheme to cover all NGO workers across the country. All of these need a functional sector infrastructure and we need to make that a priority yesterday, not now, not, not tomorrow. Um, and thirdly, I think uh, if I sort of, again, consolidate some of the questions, we really need to focus on working together to shape the narrative. We have, we have too few civil society voices in the public domain. Uh, we need many more voices and we need many more kinds of stories out there. So this is not, you know, it shouldn't just be the one uh, research report or the one event, it should really be a consistent stream of uh, success stories, innovation stories, um, need for um, where needs are emerging and what, what the new trends are. We really need a consistent, uh, coherent narrative building thing. Specifically on the question of innovative fundraising, Certainly what the pandemic did was force a lot of NGOs 
to go online. Uh, and, and so there was a, a fair amount of, of innovation in the online space. So we kind of discovered as a sector how to do online events, how to do all kinds of fundraising activities online. Uh, I, I still think we haven't gone far enough. I still think that as a sector, we are under exploiting uh, the internet as a means of either fundraising or advocacy or uh, building solidarity. Um, but certainly that's the space. There's also been, I think, a bunch of, of new actors entering the sector, uh, both as volunteer groups, citizen groups, but also as philanthropists. And we need to figure out how we're going to ensure that these new philanthropists don't take 15 years to learn what you know the more uh, experienced philanthropists have learned. How do we ensure that we speed up that learning curve so that they literally you know go to uh, take a ladder up rather than a snake? Um, so those are just some of the more sort of meta uh, responses uh, that I have for for this group here today. And I just want to thank you all again uh, for your patience and for your. Uh, your engagement, your high levels of engagement. So thank you, Ingrid. Uh, no, I, I think it's been brilliant in terms of the three framing conversations. I, I, I'm sorry, I'd be cheeky, but it's not 15 years, it's 50 years at times for most of the philanthropies. Uh, but yes, I take your point that how do we cut uh, short that time? Uh, and, and you know, the, the question about how do you look at uh, the entire uh, conversation with philanthropists, uh, infrastructure, and shaping the narrative. I think these are three bang on big buckets for us to work moving ahead. Uh, I am very mindful of the time. I'm going to request the three respondents. We take not more than two minutes, uh, uh, and then I'll just end with a couple of minutes of my thoughts before I hand it over back to uh, Arjun and Mahima. So let me go in the reverse order now. Let's just start with Jagdaji, then Binoy, and then uh, uh, then Medha. Okay, thank you, uh, Avita. I have only one point. You know, during this pandemic, I also noticed a lot of new networking opportunities have also emerged. Groupings have emerged because you know the the beauty of collectively tackling something is much better than handling it all alone, actually. So therefore, the new networking possibilities, new groupings, I think that is an area also we need to really look at at some point of time. That, and they, they did fantastic work. Thank you. I've been saying, Yabda has been saying, uh, the new groupings which emerged, my observation is whether it, whatever the dialogues have been happening or conversations happening across different NGOs, networks, government, uh, is transactional in nature. There are nothing empowering or transformative in it. Take, for example, in the past, you see how much of debate and dialogue we should do to make each engagement transformative. So we need to take note of that. If you don't become transformative in your transactions, slowly we'll be kind of pushing the buck <clears throat> transactional in nature. Second point which, what I want to make is in this pandemic, uh, Ingrid has already mentioned about that. The, the, even Medha has mentioned about it. If, 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 if the term can provide uh, oxygen concentrator, education institution moving into health, what more uh, preparedness one can have? In fact, I didn't, I didn't even know about there's something called a concent oxygen concentrator. How to even buy from somewhere. But overnight, we developed our skills. So all our uh, CSOs, in fact, during very short time, they were incredibly functional and uh, kind of uh, responded to the needs. But we are not recognized. That is the big problem. And how, why we are not recognized? That's a big question. We need to debate some other time. Uh, 
Um, I'll just end with we've gone through several waves of high optimism and pessimism, but I feel like at least how we think of a lot of things has shifted. So just maintaining, not elastically going back to where we were earlier, but at least some of these conversations, especially around um, to highlight how do we help our own sector and our own people, I think is not one that should stop now. Um, working conditions of our own teams, the support that we provide for our own teams has been a conversation that was needed even pre-pandemic. Uh, but now that it's happened, um, how do we all get together to um, ensure that social protection extensions, support extensions continue to um, be made progress on, I feel like, uh, as long as we don't uh, go back on elastically uh, business as usual. That's all I would say. So thank you, Medha. Thank you, Jagdaji and Binoy. Just a few concluding thoughts from my side, certainly not a summary of what's been said, uh, but uh, the, the thoughts that I'm going to go away with. One, I think what's coming out clearly is the huge need to look inwards and uh, about the social security, the work conditions of our own colleagues and our teams. I think that's important. We have for far too long not looked at this question. It's great to be committed, externally focused, but you cannot continue a whole sector without looking inwards. The second, I think, which came out very clearly, that we need to have different strategies uh, for conversations with different stakeholders. One is certainly the donors. And I think that's, that's a critical conversation uh, to have. The second is the larger uh, NGOs. The third, is the intermediaries that have now either cropped up or, or have emerged in the last few years and particularly uh, become more critical uh, in the last uh, uh, few uh, months or a uh, year or so. Third, I think actually seeing this as an opportunity also to redefine, redesign our work. You know, what Jagdaji said is interesting that can this be a moment for rural renaissance? That's, that's, that's an interesting way of looking at this because with the climate crisis, we have seen the IPCC report this morning in newspapers. It's clear that this economic model is not sustainable. So can we start looking at new ways of even designing and defining uh, our work? So that's the third uh, big cluster. The fourth for me is, and, and I'm constantly reading, trying to read the, the chat comments, I think our relationship with the state, which has obviously been a roller coaster, uh, and and there's no design to it. Again, to borrow from what Jagdaji was saying, that there are two different questions. One is a question of really the ideological moorings, and the architectural question of how does the state look at uh, civil society. But on the other hand, there's also a lot of hard work of actually doing the design from the national union level to working at the local panchayat level. And, and that's a lot of hard work, it, it, it takes time. So how do we start working on, on that uh, is, is critical. But I think you know the, the conversation clearly says, which, which is interesting, that the tenuous relationship with the state is part of civil society's character and we must continue with that. While we do our role in charity, let's continue holding the government accountable. Two other points. Uh, the second last is the need for a public narrative. I think we've probably been either inward looking or working only with the marginalized communities with whom we want to work or at best with the state. The broader public narrative is something we've not neither tried to influence or it's not been part of our case. And that's critical because a lot of our operating space, uh, the fundamental questions that we are asking, whether from the, the lack of understanding of philanthropies or the apathy or, or, or even I would say repression from the state also comes from there. So how do we start looking at a public narrative of what role we play and we, what the service that we have done in this country, both for building the country, but also ensuring that the the most marginalized are heard and their rights are respected. But finally, that's, that's certainly, I think what is critical is this, these conversations do not happen in a vacuum. You cannot have 
uh, a contextual conversation about civil society. Civil society is part of the larger titanic shift that we are seeing in terms of the politics of the core normative values of how the republic is defined at the moment. And we we'll need to engage with those very, very massive changes that we are looking at. If we don't do that, we'll remain bit players. And as Binoy was saying, probably doing a little of service and little of incremental work, but we'll miss the transformative moments uh, at this moment, which can be devastating from my perspective, uh, if we don't engage with a rights, human dignity, uh, justice perspective. So thank you everyone. Uh, and back to Arjun and Mahima. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, sir. Ingrid, ma'am, would you like to add anything? One, two minutes. No. Okay. Oh, just, just thanks to, to to you guys for having this for hosting this conversation uh, i've certainly learned a lot uh, and i hope uh, you know i hope we have the beginnings of some of an actual action agenda uh, emerging from this thank you thank you so much ma'am so let me quickly propose a formal vote of thanks so we thank all of you for joining today's deliberation in pre hashtag web policy talk so on behalf of center for human dignity and development at impre impact and policy research institute Thank you everyone for joining this special lecture on the impact of COVID-19 on India's non-profit sector by Ingrid Srinath Ma'am. And we are so thankful for our chair for the session, Amitabh Behar sir, and uh, uh, for chairing this session and also moderating and also to our discussants, Midha Ma'am, Jagnanda sir, Binacharya sir, thank you so much for adding your points and to all our participants here and on Facebook and those who will be watching it later on YouTube and our listen to our different podcasts. We hope that you'll also join to our future events and contribute. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day too. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.